The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we, don't we see still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Zero Squared is the Zero Books Podcast. Ernst Lohoff and Norbert Tranke are editors and writers at Crisis Magazine, which is a Marxist anti-political journal out of Germany that emphasizes the esoteric Marx and or value theory. Yes, hello, Doc. Um, um, this is Norbert talking, and um, yes, beside me is uh, Ernst Lohoff, my colleague. Um, well, you asked us to introduce ourselves a little bit. Well, as you said, uh, we are the editors and um, authors of the magazine called Crisis or Crisis in Germany. And um, this uh, magazine exists since the 1980s and was a, well, an intent to get out of, he wanted to overcome uh, the traditional Marxism. Um, well, we were not the, the only ones in, in, in Germany or in that period. Uh, many people thinking about uh, how to overcome traditional Marxism, and we uh, chose this way to go ahead with the uh, part of the Marxist uh, theory, as you said, uh, the esoteric Marx, um, focusing on the part of the Marxist Marx theory that had been left apart uh, in mostly by the traditional Marxism. Okay, so when you began the Crisis magazine, uh, that was before the Berlin Wall fell, is that right? Yes. So it, at that moment, it may not have been quite as clear to everyone that traditional Marxism was, you know, going to be very, uh, had a very, very limited lifespan ahead of it. What was it that motivated you to be critical of traditional Marxism in the in the eighties? Yeah, the end of uh, we else uh, socialism wasn't a surprise for us. Uh, we uh, expected uh, it would uh, end uh, in uh, the next uh, decade or uh, decades, not not in this year, but uh, 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 it was uh, clear for us that uh, this uh, authority, uh, authority, authority, authoritarian uh, of, uh, uh, form of. Uh, Domination uh, wasn't the uh, alternative uh, to capitalism, but uh, a form of uh, uh, capitalism. It has in common uh, the domi uh, uh, domination of uh, commodity. Is uh, it's also had been a society uh, grounded on uh, the domination of uh, commodity. For this was the background. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, our uh, theoretical uh, background uh, wasn't uh, uh, the traditional Marxism in the sense of uh, the, uh, uh, communist uh, parties in uh, in the East or so, or in, in Western Germany. We uh, came from a critical theory. Uh, this was uh, our the theoretical background. And uh, a so-called Western uh, Marxism, and uh, therefore uh, we had uh, uh, all the time uh, very much distance to uh, uh, the Eastern uh, societies. Mm -hmm. So, when you say um, critical theory and, and Western Marxism, are you? Would I be looking to um, Lukash? or to the Frankfurt School philosophers, if I was going to find your influences? Uh, more uh, Frankfurt School. Uh, Lukas, not at all. Mm, okay. 
Okay. There was a, a man named Robert Kurz who was writing at, at the same time with with you. Is that right? Yes. Were you coming out of the university with these ideas, or how did you come to be interested in critical theory? Uh, I had been at a university a, a little time, but I uh, uh, have uh, not a academic career or a background. I uh, came from a social movement. We must imagine that in that time, the so-called new social movements were very strong in, in, in Germany and or in Europe in general. Yes, I mean, you, we must imagine that in that time, the so-called new social movements were very strong in, in, in Germany and or in Europe in general. And, um, we all come from this uh, new social movement. Robert Kurz, he was a little bit older. He he had participated in the movement of 1968 student uh, movement, and but even he, he he was not at the university. We were all uh, um, outside of university, and our um, uh, and we we decided not to go to the academic uh, world because we wanted to be free to develop our own uh, ideas and. Um, not depend on, on, on some structures, on authorities. And that was our, our, our aim, to, to go ahead without any influences from in structure or the universities. So n not to be too personal, but um, I'm, I'm just now turning 49. I was born in 1970. Uh, what generation are, are you? Are you guys boomers? Are you uh, Gen X? How, how old are you? Uh, baby boomers. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, Norbert is uh, sixty years old, and I am uh, half a year younger. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, the young uh, guy. <laughs> so, I, so I'm 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 thinking of you in in a in from my American perspective. Then is sort of coming out of the '70s new left. Is that is that right? You were still you could remember 1968, or you had your you um, know, older yes, friends uh, could and. And you felt, did you feel at that moment, maybe when you were coming to Marx and critical theory, that there was still a lot of revolutionary potential on the left? Uh, it was, uh, uh, my, my uh, socialization was in uh, the beginning of the 80s. Uh, and uh, uh, there was the decline of, of the left already. Uh, and uh, this also uh, was uh, uh, one of the reasons to uh, to uh, ask uh, what are the reasons uh, for this uh, decline of uh, of mm -hmm. left movements and uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, one of the source of the interest uh, for theory uh, to think about uh, why have uh, this uh, movements revolutionary movements not uh, uh, reached uh, what we wanted to, uh, to reach. And when you formed the Crisis Journal, did you have uh, an uh, an answer? Had you were you working towards an answer for that question of why the left was declining? And what was it? If you were, we are not uh, oriented in theory, but the used theory only the used fragments of the traditional theory to. Uh, in some way legitimate their their, their practice, you know, what they were doing. And we said that um, the traditional theory has reached uh, to its limits and that we need to to, to renew it. To, and um, of course, there were some points. So, uh, one of the first points we criticized in the, in the left was the orientation to, to class uh, class struggle or class oppression and uh, the standpoint of the working class at the main point uh, and the main standpoint and we said that's not that's not the uh, the, uh, the essential thing to criticize in capitalism is not the the class struggle or the class uh, domination but it's an, it's, it's, uh, it's something more fundamental and uh, that was the starting point to to look to to re 
read Marx and to and to search for the uh, parts in a theory that were that uh, uh, that were not uh, uh, that were not discussed in that time or or only in a minor very minority uh, segment of the of the left and uh, this was this uh, orientation on criticism on uh, the fetishism of commodity and uh, uh, criticism on value and uh, uh, to to look at this point at this at the, as the essentials points of departure for a critique on capitalism I, I think that there was a has been for a while a debate on the left between people who feel as though oppression and domination is what's most important and most critical to understand. And maybe they'll talk about uh, power as the most important thing to understand or political power is the most important thing to understand. And those who focus on exploitation uh, as the most important aspect of capitalism. And, and often that can slip into talk of oppression. But if you focus on exploitation, then you're drawn to see what the ideological formation is around production. You might be drawn to Marx's value theory as he developed it in in Capital. And you might look towards, I think, a little bit in the direction of that you are looking um, in the terms of like being concerned about the commodity form and the aims of production. How do uh, do you think it was that the question of domination and the question of exploitation became uh, considered a, to be opposed? Uh, I have a question to you. Uh, have you uh, talked uh, about uh, uh, traditional Marxism in the, uh, in the sense of uh, 70s uh, and the discussion uh, uh, in uh, this time or uh, uh, original uh, working class movement. When I think of traditional Marxism, I'm thinking of it in the way that Moish Pistone uh, described it in his theory, uh, Time, Labor, and Social Domination. And I'm not distinguishing it be very much between, like, let's say the Bolshevik version of traditional Marx Marxism uh, from what might have been on people's lips in the 70s, 1970s. Yes. Uh, so maybe you can explain what traditional Marxism is and uh, to you, and, and then we can move on from there. Well, we agree with Moish Pastone in this point uh, um, when he says that uh, there are some uh, uh, essential features of uh, traditional Marxism, which would be... Um, that the essence of capitalist domination is that it's uh, class domination, um, the domination of capital upon labor. And the other point that, that the labor or the working class uh, appears in the traditional Marxism as being a transhistorical principle and the counter principle to capital. And um, uh, thus the, the traditional Marxism makes always a positive reference to the standpoint of labor, and considers it, it as a um, standpoint point of emancipation. So we agree with Moshe Pastor on this point, and we had a very similar critique, um, uh, which was, um, it, it's funny because we, we um, Started from a, a similar point, uh, Moshe Postone, he studied in, in Frankfurt, as you may, might know. He was very influenced by the critical theory, and um, and uh, we had the same starting point, and, but we developed our theory uh, independently, and then in the 90s we, we had contact. So, um, but we agree with him in this point uh, almost completely. Um, and, and I think this was one of the limits of traditional Marxism, which was already in the in the 70s. Uh, uh, it was clear for many people that the traditional Marxism had reached its li its limits because it was not uh, he, he was not able to explain uh, all the forms of domination uh, which. Uh, 
uh, where um, uh, or um, starting point of the new social movements, you know, uh, feminist movement and uh, anti-racist and anti-sexism, uh, anti-colonial and all those things. So there was a broad critique or criticism on, on traditional Marxism in the 1970s and the 80s. And... Um, uh, of course, in a certain way, we, we are part of this. We were part of this uh, criticism, but we took another way as the normal, as most of the of the uh, traditional Marxists. Uh, let me explain this a little bit. Um, uh, I think that uh, the path that uh, most of the Marxists took, I mean, those that did not remain on a very orthodox uh, uh, standpoint, um, most um, uh, or many Marxists uh, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s um, co try to complement the view of capitalism as being a domination of capital upon labor, and they complemented it with other forms of domination, uh, above all, um, form of racist and sexist domination, but they did not. Uh, um, uh, criticize uh, the uh, main or central point of traditional Marxism, which was this orientation on labor. It was just added in some way. No? It's, it's something of an of an uh, the, uh, of an uh, it was additive in a certain way. We had uh, different forms of domination, one uh, added to the other. And we tried to take another, a different path, and um, oriented uh, ourselves toward the, the path of uh, Marxist Marx theory, as I told you, I said before, which was uh, the uh, critique on uh, of uh, commodity uh, fetishism of commodity. What does this mean? It means that we see the essence of the uh, or, or the core of capitalist society in the fact that uh, in this society all the social relations take the form of commodities, and this form uh, becomes independent of people. In other words, people is or are dominated by their own social relations in the form of things. And well, that's what uh, called uh, Marx calls uh, essentially the fetishism of commodity production, right? And um, but this is of course a very abstract definition of capitalist, domina capitalist domination, uh, just a starting point. So it must be more concrete or more precise, and that's what we tried all these years to to to. Uh, uh, make this starting point more concrete and more precise um, in, in our theory. Uh, but uh, it meant, uh, from the first moment on, it meant a change in perspective, uh, which was fundamental, uh, because um, there are a lot of consequences uh, uh, belonging or depending on the starting point or coming from the starting point. When I talked to Moish Pastone and when I've read his work, one of the key differences between the traditional Marxists and the uh, kind of uh, Marxism that he advocates that based on critical theory, uh, I think comes down to an understanding of the uh, what is the subject of capitalism or who is the revolutionary subject of capitalism. Although to put it in terms of who might be misleading, uh, and uh, it seems to me that um, if you in, that in the seventies and eighties in the United States, anyhow, when people have uh, uh, abandoned labor or, or decided to look away from class and find a new re revolutionary subject or a, 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 maybe a coalition of revolutionary subjects that they um, have held on to one of the primary ideas from traditional Marxism that made that Moise Pistone was attempting to reject and that is that within the capitalist social order there are already categories of people 
who are the revolutionary subject that 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 capitalism is generating uh, its own grave diggers, you know, and that. But Moise Pistone would say that the revolutionary subject uh, or the subject of capitalism is value it, itself is the the production of value. It's um, it's capital. And that uh, a project to um, break from capitalism can't s begin with finding the I its own subjectivity within capitalism. So would you agree with that, that one of the differences between uh, traditional Marxism and uh, this value-theoretic Marxism is the way in which we are left without a radical subject uh, already pre-made for us? But uh, Marx uh, has the notion of uh, the capital as an automatical subject, and uh, this is an ironical uh, notion, of course. He uh, says uh, uh, we uh, have to... Uh, Dif differ from uh, the positive uh, uh, idea of uh, subjectivity and uh, this means uh, we are uh, uh, the masters of our fate uh, uh, in uh, our uh, tra uh, traditional thinking uh, uh, this is the meaning of, of subject and uh, uh, Marx, uh, 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 ironical notion of uh, uh, the capital as the automatical subject means uh, uh, it's uh, uh, the other way around. We uh, don't have a question at all. We have a negative sub uh, notion of subject. I think that having a negative subject uh, and not having a, a, a concept of a revolutionary subject is your answer i mean that's the answer to the question as i as i asked it and my motivation behind that question was that in the united states as these new social movements came about they seemed to take up let's say uh women or ethnic minorities as the new version of the positive subject under capitalism as a new revolutionary subject and I wanted to clarify that when you were coming, even though you were coming out of those new social movements and, and had the, a similar critique of labor as the re revolutionary subject, you weren't simply replacing labor with a new, like, say, subaltern revolutionary subject. You had a different conception. Yes, we have a, a different concept, uh, but this different of concept is also a, a question uh, what kind of emancipation uh, you have in mind. Emancipation of the working class or also emancipation of uh, women or uh, fighting of colored people or fighting of people who were excluded from a capitalist society who had no place in commodity society. And uh, the content on the, uh, and the aim of this movement was to uh, become, to get a place in, to be also a free and equal uh, subject of commodity. And if you uh, think emancipation from a commodity, you uh, must have uh, another concept of emancipation. Uh, this uh, concept isn't uh, one of uh, who is the subject of emancipation, but uh, uh, what is the content of emancipation. Uh, we have a change of paradigm from uh, uh, who are the people who fight for uh, freedom, uh, what is the group who is predestinated uh, to be the incarnation of the new order, to what is the content of the new order. I wanted to get to this. This difference is so in some ways so simple i mean you can reduce it to it's not a question of who will rule but a question of uh, what kind of society do we want right it, and yet i find that a lot of marxists who even would appear to understand this difference end up acting as though the major difficulty facing us is how to find power 
in amongst ourselves today how to take political power, uh, how to organize or convince the masses, whether those masses are conceived of as workers or just the 99% or something else. So I'm wondering, how is it that the idea that we needed to develop a new basis for society, a new mediating social relationship, say, how did that become esoteric? And this would be my segue into the question I sent you, which is, how did Marx's value theory, as he developed it in Capital and, and, and other places, become known as the esoteric side of Marx, why is this as difficult as it appears to be? Uh, it's a question of uh, the historical uh, uh, epoch you, uh, you are in. For a uh, uh, working class movement, it was indeed esoterical because uh, 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 their uh, needs were uh, to uh, uh, get a place in uh, uh, the commodity society and uh, to emancipate as as people who have uh, to uh, sell uh, their uh, working craft no, labor power labor power oh, mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, and uh, they emancipated into uh, the uh, uh, forms of commo uh, commodity society and uh, 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 when this is uh, the content of the movement, uh, uh, there is no use of uh, uh, such an esoteric thing as a commodity uh, critic. I mean, uh, maybe to to clarify a little bit the difference between exoteric and esoteric. Yeah. Uh, uh, because uh, this is a term that comes from uh, Roman Rodolski. Uh, uh, in his book about the capital, Marx's capital, and um, so what he means essentially that uh, the exoteric part of, of the Marx of Marx theory is the class domination. That's what people uh, felt every day, you know, uh, being oppressed by capital, being forced to work in in in, in the in the factory and these things. And of course, this is part of the capital domination, uh, of course. But uh, what it's not so obvious, uh, in this sense, esoteric, uh, hidden in a certain way, is uh, that behind this uh, uh, domination of, of, of uh, uh, capital upon labor, there is a um, form of abstract domination uh, which is uh, the domination of the things uh, uh, of the things in form of commodities that relation of people take the forms of things and dominate them in a in a in a let's say um, uh, reified way in a in a in an abstract way in that you cannot grasp it you cannot control it it's a it's a form of of a, of dynamic uh, of the society uh, which is specific for the capitalist society a dynamic which cannot be controlled by people that's uh, the, the the capital in a certain way moves by in himself or by itself and uh, in this way marx talks of the automatic subject uh, and in a in a ironic way and in a critical way saying that look uh, you think that you are very very um, uh, illuminated you know capitalist society or people in the, in the bourgeois society think that they are very uh, they they are not religious that they know how to manage the things and he says look you're not managing your society the society is managing you. It's a subject that dominates you. And that's what he calls the abstract domination. And that's the esoteric side, the hidden side of capitalist domination. To be clear, this abstract form, the commodity form that's um, dominating society and everyone in it is not a positive force. In other words, it's not as though, let's say there's a flying saucer over the earth that's a concrete subject that's imposing 
this commodity form on everything. And if we just got rid of it, uh, rid of the UFO, say we would be free of the commodity form. The commodity form is, is doing something. It's a, it's a, it's a frame for our social relations to work in, right? It's a, it's like a set of rules almost that we follow maybe without always even thinking about them in order to produce the world together. And it's just that the way in which that commodity form functions has these unintended consequences and is reliant on exploitation and class divisions. And so our task isn't necessarily to merely free ourselves from the commodity, but also to develop a new form of, of social relations, some new mediating structure. Yes, uh, yes, I agree completely. That's that's the the central point. Um, that um, and that was one point that in traditional Marxism uh, wasn't seen. I mean, traditional Marxism was in certain way oriented to to the liberation or emancipation uh, of labor from the power of capital. And what we think about is uh, we need to emancipate from from labor and from commodity and develop a form of uh, uh, new social um, uh, relationship which uh, uh, would be um, without domination which would be the free as, as Marx calls it the free association of the individuals which organize themselves now how much of the work of crisis as a journal has been aimed at thinking through potential new social relations, new forms of uh, productive and uh, civil life, and what have been, what, what limits have there been on that kind of thinking uh, that you found? Those are two questions. The main subject uh, was, for us, was uh, the analyze of uh, capitalist society and uh, we have no utopian uh, painting also the picture of a new society if you analyze uh, capital uh, precise enough precisely enough uh, you it's it's clear what uh, uh, what is uh, the, the the solution our main work uh, is to to uh, come uh, to such a precise analyze but uh, uh, that you uh, have also uh, practice uh, consequences for pra uh, practice yes but uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course we had we had some uh, some writings or we have some writings about the question how uh, what what the new society should be about or how to uh, how uh, a transformation, social transformation, could be uh, go on. So it's not 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 uh, there are not many writings, but we had uh, of course we we had this this question and um, thinking about. Uh, I mean, if you if you criticize the commodity production on the one hand, and on the other hand you criticize the state, the nation. As we do, so then of course there is a the solution cannot be like in traditional Marxism to uh, to get to the power or to get to the government by revolution or by elections uh, and then uh, then reorganize society from a central point from the central point of the government of the state. So of course we. Can I jump in and ask a question here? Uh, because it seems to me as though you could conceive if you like if you think about the dictatorship of the proletariat, as it's been described, maybe by Marx, or if you think about what's in the critique of the Gotha program, which is something a little bit different, um, you could imagine that there would be a moment in which the proletariat would seize power and they would, uh, through the power of the state, change the structure of production but they wouldn't do it uh, in order to hold on to the state but the state would be used to basically protect the proletariat as they transformed their social relationships and and overcame their own position i mean that's how i understand that notion it's not that's why the state is going to wither away is because it's only being used 
in a in a moment or you know in a, in a maybe the transition would last weeks or months or a year but it would not be a new form of society it would be it would be the process of break um can would you think that that kind of use of state power and revolutionary force could bring about the transformation that we're I think we are in a in another historical situation uh, this concept of uh, dictatorship of uh, proletarian it was a uh, uh, fruit of a of a rise of a mo modern commodity society where the state also had a, a role and uh, nowadays uh, we have uh, uh, another historical background. We have failed state. Uh, we have a, a crisis of uh, uh, regulation, of political regulation, and uh, uh, we have to find uh, answers to these uh, problems. And uh, I don't think uh, that uh, we can uh, use uh, uh, this uh, concept uh, of. Uh, of uh, of traditional Marxism, I can uh, understand why people uh, uh, developed uh, this concept. And uh, my problem isn't uh, to criticize uh, the people uh, who uh, uh, tried uh, uh, to find this way and uh, uh, fought, uh, had fought for socialism. Uh, I have problems uh, with people who think uh, this is uh, orientation uh, for us in our times. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in certain way it's not. It's, not, it's of course a, a, a question of the historical situation. We are in a complete different situation today than, for example, Lenin in, in the uh, hundred years ago in Russia. Uh, and in this time, there was no there was no modern state in, in Russia, or uh, or even the states in Europe uh, was not so developed as it was then in the in the, in the uh, trust course of the of this 20th century. And now we have a crisis of state and crisis of politics. That's one point. But the other point is that um, the concept of uh, of uh, organization of uh, of self organization of self uh, uh, in the traditional Marxism always was an instrument to 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 create the proletarian state. It was the concept. No? So um, and we think that uh, it must be different. We we have a state, but uh, now the self-organization must be the central point we cannot just use it for anything but that's the that's the essence of emancipation it is the self-organization so we so if we have a transformation today um it, it will it must be oriented in the self-organization of people and uh, and the uh, acquisition or of, of resources to create these structures of self-organization from my reading of Marx, and that's primarily, you know, where I'm oriented, um, my thought was, and this isn't traditional Marxism, but this is my reading of Marx, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, different things. Um, uh, it's that what he conceived of, like, was that you would have a moment in which, let's say you would use um, labor vouchers, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. Uh, to uh, mediate uh, the relationship of working people to a common store of goods. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of those labor vouchers was not that they would be fair and just or that that mediation would be the new state of – would be like liberation for workers, but rather that it would make clear the problem of using labor time – as a way to mediate your uh, social relations, not only in terms of um, production, but also in terms of exchange, so that you the uh, inequality and the unfairness of uh, exchanges based on labor time would become very clear as you use labor vouchers. And the need for them, as that became more and more clear, would fall away, so that rather than seeking equality, through exchange, you would seek um, basically to be in a, in, a, in a moment where 
everyone was participating at their best capacity, you know, creatively to produce the world and to, and to create their own relations. And there would be, you know, the maxim is from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. Um, and that's, that's a very abstract and incomplete way of conceiving of what the basis of those relationships would be. But the labor voucher, um, idea was one in which I think it was meant to be a step towards freeing ourselves from the need for exchanges based on labor time altogether. Um, and it would, but it would there in that moment require some sort of force that would maintain a common store of goods and that would set up the exchanges based and uh, distribute labor vouchers and, you know, there would be a state intervening between the workers and their productive goods. We are um, now entering in a, in a very detailed discussion about transformation, but um, uh, I would prefer to say it in a more uh, fundamental way. Um, the mediation uh, through labor, uh, um, I agree in this point with, with Moshe Pastone and um, uh, that the mediation uh, through labor cannot be conscious. Yes, so um, that that the the, um, the fact that people does exchange things uh, by labor uh, and makes not not a great difference if it labor vouchers or, or money, uh, then. Uh, it, it, it's an indirect, in, indirect way of uh, of mediation and the form of mediation that tends to independize uh, or be independent from people and dominate them. So I don't think that uh, this would be uh, the correct the, the the way to to get to a, a emancipated society. That's one point. That's the fundamental point. And the second point is that. We are now, uh, I think we must see also that we are uh, perceived that we are in a historical situation where labor is not longer uh, the decisive factor for production. Yes, um, the capitalism has uh, dynamics which, uh, uh, as you know, that uh, tends to develop the productivity in a very uh, fast way. And as uh, Marx already said in the Grundrisse, or so in the Grundrisse, um, there come, the, he said there, there will come the point where the uh, productive force of labor will be, uh, uh, will be pushed away by the productive force of knowledge, that knowledge dominates the production. And that's the point where the capitalism, in a certain way, does not function anymore. Because capitalism is based on labor, but on the same time, by so its own contradiction, internal contradiction, it tends to uh, to make a lab labor superfluous and to to put uh, the knowledge uh, uh, on the place of labor. So, um, in in a certain in this this situation, we are in this situation uh, at least since 30, 40 years. Uh, with the beginning of the third industrial revolution, we came to that point empirically. And so now the knowledge is the main productive force. And uh, um, in a certain way, in capitalism, this, uh, this uh, point or this, um, this factor um, that knowledge is so important uh, expresses itself in form of crisis. So a new society would be one where um, we, we, we don't ha have even the need to, to, uh, to use labor as a form of mediation because we are, not, uh, we are not depending on labor anymore, or not essentially. We're depending on the form how society organizes the, pro uh, the production upon the basis of knowledge but in a rational way, we are now on the, in the point of capitalism where this, the knowledge is used in a very ir ir irrational, destructive way, and the new society would would have to the would have to to change this and organize uh, the productive forces that are developed in a in a new way. 
one of the things that happened as we've reached this point is that the state intervened in such a way so that the development of, of knowledge that really was outstripping the need for uh, the commodity form never quite arrived because of the property relations that could be enforced and the way that monetization of intellectual property came came to dominate i think that knowledge is uh, uh, is uh, a product in a certain way a social product general intellect as marx says that does not uh, that goes beyond the commodity form because a commodity must be isolated in a certain way it must be produced every every time again and knowledge one time it is produced it's uh, it's universal it's uh, it's there you don't need to produce it again and so uh, it goes beyond the commodity form, but in under capitalist conditions, uh, you are right that the state uh, um, uh, assures the private property and creates the knowledge as a form of commodity because it, it, there are restrictions to 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 use the knowledge restrictions which are not in the uh, not not abound or not uh, grounded in the in the knowledge itself, but only in the social form, only in the in the in the private property of of, of knowledge rights, you know, of copyrights, and so. Here's, I guess, my final question: How have you experienced the left and the Marxist left in the response to your journal, and what have the barriers been to opening up? a conversation around uh, the esoteric marks or around uh, a, a value, critical, uh, radical Marxism. And and uh, if you've encountered the same kind of resistance that I have, as I've come to try to take a similar position, I think, to yours, what do you think accounts for the resistance? And are we stuck waiting for capitalism to develop conditions where it can become easier for people to to see uh, their way to this kind of position, or 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 is there something we could be doing politically and in terms of communication and organizing to facilitate uh, the taking up of the esoteric marks? Well, that's a difficult question because um, I think um, in a certain way, uh, as we talked before, um, the traditional left uh, in, the, in the 19th century or even in the beginning of the 20th century uh, was oriented to the so-called exoteric mark, to the standpoint of labor, because there was a there was, was an internal development of capitalism, the working class fighting for recognition, uh, inside of capitalism, and um, now they are still, um, in some way, still bounded to this theory, but in a situation where this theory is not uh, has not any ground, any, any fundament, any fundament anymore, uh, because um, we are at the point where, um, uh, in in uh, in some way, it becomes uh, uh, increasingly clear that uh, the traditional Marxism has no answers to the situation of uh, we are in today, but they still um, um, depend on these ideas, uh, let's say, because of a certain nostalgia. Do you say it like this? Um, um, they, it's, it, it seems to be something something which in the past uh, worked, yes, uh, there were revolutionary mo movements, and so the left still is oriented to this uh, to this past which is glorified in a certain way, and uh, the, most of them, or, or many or great parts of the left, do not see that uh, the situation today is completely different. Um, well, let me explain a little bit more because it, I think it's increasingly clear that the accumulation of value, uh, that means the production of abstract wealth, is reaching to its absolute limits. Uh, let's say in, in, in two respects mainly. Uh, first, because it's obvious that the production of abstract wealth, uh, which is 
based on endless expansion comes in conflict conflict with the limits of the natural world and natural sources. This is uh, the ecological side of crisis, which is becoming clearer and clearer, and where the traditional Marxism has no answer to. On the other hand, uh, the, the capitalist dynamics um, has long since uh, questioned the centrality of labor by pushing productivity forward. We, we don't have the centrality of labor anymore, but uh, Marxist, uh, traditional Marxists still try to, uh, to hang on uh, on, the, on the centrality of labor. So, uh, in certain way, I think uh, we, we, we could give clearer answers to the actual situation than the traditional Marxism can do. But, uh, of course, it's difficult to, uh, to, to fight against a tradition which, uh, which has, uh, well, let's say, a tradition has a certain gravity, yes? <laughs> uh, People hang on the tradition because it's a tradition, not because it's really uh, something that explains their, their actual situation.